there is a risk when we use financial sanctions that are linked to the role of dollar, the dollar that over time it could undermine the hegemony of the dollar. More than a quarter of the global population lives in countries that are targeted by U.S. sanctions. And the vast majority of those sanctions are illegal according to international law. And as Washington has used sanctions more and more as a geopolitical weapon, it has encouraged countries around the world to seek alternatives to the U.S. dollar. In the past two decades, the U.S. government's use of sanctions has increased by nearly 1,000 percent, over 900 percent. Countries under sanctions by the U.S. include China, Russia, Iran, Syria, Zimbabwe, Eritrea, Ethiopia, Venezuela, Nicaragua, Cuba. There are so many countries around the world. And now many of those countries are trying to create alternative payment mechanisms and financial institutions to get around the dominance of the U.S. dollar. This has been clear for years, but we now see U.S. government officials acknowledging it, admitting it publicly. The Secretary of the Treasury, Janet Yellen, did an interview with CNN with the host Fareed Zakaria. And in the interview, Zakaria asked her about the growing number of countries who are looking for alternatives to the dollar, not only including countries like Brazil, which are part of the BRICS system, but even potentially allies of the United States in Europe, like France. And in response, Yellen said that, yes, there is a risk with the use of sanctions to over time undermine the hegemony of the dollar. Let me ask you about one of the costs or one of the prices of these sanctions. The way that the United States has used sanctions often in this case, in the case of the Iran uh, nuclear deal, is to use the power of the dollar as the as the reserve currency of the world. But that weaponization of the dollar has produced a reaction. This week, President Lula in Brazil said, why are we all uh, being forced to use the dollar? Emmanuel Macron made reference to the dollar in that same way. The European Commission has talked about, after Trump pulled out of the Iran sanctions, talked about creating an alternative to SWIFT, to the um, American-dominated payment system. Uh, Is there a danger that we will look back at all this, you know, these these measures, and say this was the moment that the dollar's hegemony and its its status as a reserve currency began to falter. So, there is a risk when we use financial sanctions that are linked to the role of dollar, the dollar, that over time it could undermine the hegemony of the dollar, as you said, but. Um, This is an extremely important tool we try to use judiciously and in circumstances, especially when we have the support of our allies. It's not just the United States. It's um, a coalition of partners um, acting together uh, to impose these sanctions. So it is a very effective tool. Of course, it does create a desire on the part um, of China, of Russia, of Iran um, to find an alternative. But uh, the dollar is used as a global currency for reasons that are are not easy for other countries to um, find, find an alternative with the same properties. For those who want to get links to all of the sources that I'll be discussing today, I wrote a report about this over at geopoliticaleconomy.com, and I have it linked in the description below. Now, this has been clear for many years now, so better late than never, I suppose, but I researched these issues very closely, and I think this is the first time that a top-level U.S. government official has publicly acknowledged the fact that the constant increasing use of U.S. sanctions has actually backfired and weakened the hegemony of the U.S. dollar. Up to this point, from what I've seen from my research, the only other U.S. officials who have acknowledged this are not top-level 
fiscal officials overseeing U.S. economic policy like the Secretary of the Treasury. Instead, we've seen comments here or there by senators and Congress people. Like, for instance, this March, the neoconservative Republican senator from Florida, Marco Rubio, did an interview with Fox News complaining about China and Brazil trading with their own currencies. And he acknowledged that this is going to prevent the U.S. from being able to impose sanctions on countries around the world. Look, it goes beyond these things that just today, today, Brazil, in our hemisphere, largest country in the Western Hemisphere south of us, cut a trade deal with China. They're going to from now on do trade in their own currencies, get right around the dollar. They're creating a, a secondary economy in the world, totally independent of the United States. We won't have to talk about sanctions in five years because there'll be so many countries transacting in currencies other than the dollar that, that we won't have the ability to sanction them. But Marco Rubio is just a senator. He's not overseeing the creation of fiscal policy for the United States. Janet Yellen is one of the top U.S. government officials overseeing economic policy. Right now, she's the head of the Treasury, and the Treasury oversees not only U.S. fiscal policy, but it oversees the implementation of U.S. sanctions, which are overseen specifically by the Treasury's Office of Foreign Asset Control, OFAC. And in addition to that, before, Janet Yellen was the chair of the U.S. Central Bank, the Federal Reserve. That makes her one of the most important officials in overseeing U.S. economic policy in modern history. And her admitting this publicly is a very significant development. And it shows that the more and the more that the U.S. uses this sanctions weapon, the more and more it backfires. Now, there were several points in Yellen's comments that I want to respond to that are very misleading. First of all, she tried to portray U.S. sanctions as multilateral, saying that Washington does this in alliance with its allies. Well, okay, if, if by allies she means Europe, but Europe is not the global community. She talked about the global community in the speech, but in reality, the global community is represented by the United Nations. And every single year at the United Nations, the majority of the actual global community, the countries in the global south, the vast majority, condemn the illegal U.S. and EU sanctions imposed on the rest of the world, including for 60 years, the U.S. has imposed an illegal criminal blockade on Cuba. Every single year, the entire world, excluding the U.S. and Israel, vote against this illegal blockade. So that's a clear example of her misleading claims, but also... If the U.S. and EU, even if they agree and they impose sanctions on a country, if they do not have the support of the United Nations Security Council, those are illegal sanctions. Those are illegal unilateral coercive measures and they violate international law. It doesn't matter if the U.S. gets Britain and the EU to join with it. Just because some allies went along with the U.S. doesn't mean that it's legal. Those are illegal sanctions. Furthermore, one of the most absurd comments that Janet Yellen made in that CNN interview is she claimed that Washington imposes sanctions judiciously. This is an extremely important tool we try to use judiciously. That is completely preposterous. More than one quarter of the global population lives under illegal U.S. sanctions. This is something that the United States has done more and more out of control. It's actually the polar opposite of judicious use of sanctions. Every time a foreign country does something that the United States doesn't like, it imposes sanctions on them pretty much. Basically, every single week, Washington imposes new illegal unilateral sanctions. The economist Timothy Taylor went through the documents of the Treasury's OFAC, Office of Foreign Assets Control, that documents and regulates sanctions. And he found that the application of unilateral sanctions by the U.S. increased by a staggering 933% from 2000 until 2021. In 2000, the U.S. had 912 sanctions on foreign countries. As of 2021, the U.S. had 9,421 sanctions. And that number has only increased further since then with more sanctions on Venezuela, Cuba, and especially Russia. The U.S. has imposed a huge number of sanctions on Russia. So 
it's likely that now there are more than 10,000 U.S. sanctions. And furthermore, the countries targeted by those U.S. sanctions have shifted. In 2000, U.S. sanctions were largely on Cuba, Iraq, Libya, Yugoslavia, and Iran. And today, all of those countries are still sanctioned by the United States. I mean, Yugoslavia no longer exists as a country. It was destroyed, at least. So the countries that weren't destroyed by the U.S., I mean, the U.S. also tried to destroy Iraq and Libya and basically did destroy their governments. But anyway, the point is that today, those countries are still under sanctions. And now there are a huge number of sanctions on Venezuela, Russia, Syria, the DPRK, the official legal name of North Korea, and more and more sanctions on Iran as well. So the idea that, as Janet Yellen says, that the U.S. has been judicious with sanctions is absolutely absurd. Now, in this interview that Janet Yellen did on CNN, she claimed that the Western sanctions on Russia have been a success. She said that they've led Russia's oil exports to decrease by 40% in their overall value. Although I'm not so sure that that's really about this Western sanctions or rather just the decrease in the price of oil in the global market. But anyway, she also took credit for the sanctions leading to Russia having a government budgetary deficit. And yes, it's true that before the escalation of this proxy war in Ukraine, Russia did have a, a budget surplus and now has a government deficit. But I don't really think that's because of sanctions. I think that's actually mostly because it's spending more and more money to wage this proxy war in Ukraine with NATO, that NATO is waging against Russia to try to overthrow the Russian government. That was explicitly what Joe Biden said in a speech in Poland. The U.S. goal is regime change in the Kremlin, overthrowing the government. Now, also in the CNN interview, Fareed Zakaria asked Yellen about what the U.S. plans to do with the $300 billion worth of foreign exchange reserves that the U.S. and the European Union stole from Russia. Now, the foreign exchange reserves of a country are basically the government savings that it holds in the central bank. And the Bank of Russia had $300 billion in U.S. dollar assets and in euro assets that were held in Western banks. And they were seized illegally, unilaterally by the West. And the U.S. has hinted that it plans on stealing that money and giving that money that belongs to the Russian people instead to Ukraine. In the interview, Zakaria asked if that's what the Treasury plans on doing. Let me ask you one question about Ukraine, about uh, rebuilding Ukraine, resupplying it. It's going to take a lot of money. Yes. There are some who say th this money should be taken from Russia's frozen central bank reserves. Would you agree with that? I think Russia should pay for the damage that it has done to Ukraine. So that's a responsibility that I think um, the global community expects Russia to bear. This is something we're discussing with our partners, but, um, you know, there are legal constraints on um, what we can do. We have frozen Russian assets, um, and we're discussing with our partners what um, might lie in the future, but I think that's the right thing for to happen that Russia should pay for the damages that it's caused. Janet Yellen did not answer clearly. She hinted that the United States would like to use this money to fund Ukraine, but she admitted that there are legal constraints. That's a tacit acknowledgement that this is piracy. This is complete a violation of international law. It's totally criminal. Just stealing foreign countries foreign exchange reserves. But it's what the United States did to Venezuela and what Europe did to Venezuela, stealing billions of dollars belonging to the Venezuelan Central Bank. It's what the U.S. did to Iran. And it's also what the U.S. did to Afghanistan. And the theft of the Afghanistan, the Afghan Central Bank's Centr uh, foreign exchange reserves has fueled a hyperinflation crisis leading to what could potentially be a famine in Afghanistan that could kill huge numbers of Afghans. And despite that, 
The U.S. government has made it clear that it's stealing that money from the Afghan Central Bank and using it to pay 9-11 victims. And Afghanistan had nothing to do with 9-11. So this is completely absurd. Anyway, the point is that Yellen doesn't say openly that the U.S. is going to steal that money from Russia and give it to Ukraine. But she does hint that the U.S. and its allies, she said, we're consulting with our allies, meaning Europe. So Washington and Brussels would like to do so. Now, as I said earlier, it's been very clear for years that the constant use of sanctions by the U.S. has fueled the drive toward de-dollarization, incentivizing countries around the world to seek alternatives to U.S. dollar hegemony. And this has been acknowledged even by mainstream media outlets. For instance, The Economist, which represents the British ruling class. All of their articles are anonymous. It, it, you know, it's this kind of blob. It's this center-right neoliberal free market ideology that we constantly see among Western political elites. And they published an article in 2020 titled, America's Aggressive Use of Sanctions Endangers the Dollar's Reign. So this has been very clear for a while now. Even as far back as 1998, the Brookings Institution, which is an establishment think tank in Washington, D.C., it basically has a revolving door with the U.S. government. Even back then, it was acknowledging that U.S. sanctions were too much of a bad thing. And this was an article written by Richard Haas. Richard Haas is a former U.S. diplomat. He worked in the State Department in the Bush administration and worked closely with Colin Powell, with all the neocons. And he was an, one of the architects of the Iraq war. And since then, he's now become the, the chief of the Council on Foreign Relations, which has, is another an, an elite group with a revolving door with the U.S. government. So it's been known for well over 20 years that U.S. sanctions do serious economic damage to foreign countries that lead to millions, literally millions of civilians losing their lives and suffering. The most shameful example of this was back in the 1990s when the U.S. and Europe pressed, pressed for sanctions on Iraq uh, under the government of Saddam Hussein. Those sanctions led to more than one million deaths according to the former top United Nations official, Dennis Halliday. Dennis Halliday was an assistant secretary general of the UN, one of the top level officials, and he was the United Nations humanitarian coordinator in Iraq. And in 1998, Dennis Halliday resigned in protest, saying that the, that the Western sanctions on Iraq resulted in genocide. He said the G word, genocide. This is a report from back in the time at the Cornell Chronicle, the newspaper of Cornell University, where he was giving lectures at the time. And he said, he estimated that the Western-led sanctions on Iraq resulted in between 1 million and 1.5 million Iraqis dying from malnutrition or an inadequate health care. And he said, quote, we are now in there responsible for killing people, destroying their families, their children, allowing their older parents to die for lack of basic medicines. We're in there allowing children to die who were not born yet when Saddam Hussein made the mistake of invading Kuwait. And in response to the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait, which, by the way, the U.S. government gave the green light to, and then in response, the U.S carried out a brutal bombing campaign and massacres in Iraq. This article notes that the U.S. bombing of Iraqi civilian infrastructure destroyed most of its infrastructure, including sewage, electrical power, healthcare, and agriculture. And then sanctions have prevented this, this infrastructure from being rebuilt. And U.S. officials, including Colin Powell, boasted that they bombed Iraq back into the Stone Ages, as they said. And after bombing it back into the Stone, Age, Stone Ages, and over, after overseeing the so-called Highway of Death, in which the U.S. massacred Iraqi soldiers who were fleeing, literally they were fleeing and they had their backs turned and the U.S. just massacred them. After that, the U.S. led these sanctions, these genocidal U.N. sanctions on Iraq. And according to the former U.N. humanitarian coordinator in Iraq, Dennis Halliday, he said, quote, for me, what is tragic is 
in addition to the tragedy of Iraq itself, is the fact that the United Nations Security Council member states are maintaining a program of economic sanctions deliberately, knowingly killing thousands of Iraqis each month, and that definition fits genocide. Again, this was a top UN official who said this back in 1999, well over two decades ago, and yet the ap application unilaterally, illegally of U.S. sanctions has increased by nearly 1,000% since he made those remarks. And today we continue seeing how illegal U.S. sanctions suffocate civilian populations in countries like in Iran and Nicaragua and Cuba and Venezuela. The Center for Economic and Policy Research, which is really one of the only good think tanks in Washington, D.C., it's one of the only think tanks that's actually separate from the government. They published a report back in 2019 by the economists Mark Weisbrot and Jeffrey Sachs. Jeffrey Sachs, a world-renowned economist and professor at Columbia University, who ironically previously had overseen neoliberal shock therapy policies in the former Soviet Union that led to millions of excess deaths, according to UNICEF. But he has since done a 180, and he's now much better today. And he and Mark Weisbrot co-authored this report titled Economic Sanctions as Collective Punishment, the Case of Venezuela. And in their report, they wrote that the impact of most U.S. sanctions has not been on the government, but on the civilian population. And sanctions imposed on countries like Venezuela reduces the public's caloric intake, so the amount of food they have. Sanctions increase disease and mortality for both adults and infants. And illegal U.S. sanctions displaced millions of Venezuelans who fled the country as a result of the work worsening economic depression and hyperinflation. U.S. sanctions exacerbated Venezuela's economic crisis and made it nearly impossible to stabilize the economy, contributing further to excess deaths. All of these impacts disproportionately harmed the poorest and most vulnerable Venezuelans. And the report found that illegal U.S. sanctions inflict very serious harm to human life and health, including an estimated more than 40,000 deaths just from 2017 to 2018. So not even in the entire time that sanctions have been in Venezuela, which is now nearly a decade, going back to 2015, when the Obama administration passed a ridiculous executive order declaring Venezuela to be a so-called extraordinary and unusual threat to the national security of the United States. And since then, U.S. sanctions have exploded against Venezuela into a full-on blockade. So just from 2017 to 2018, at least 40,000 Venezuelan civilians died. This is, this is a crime against humanity. The reality is that hundreds of thousands of Venezuelans have probably died in total because of these illegal U.S. sanctions. And the scholars at the Center for Economic and Policy Research pointed out that these illegal U.S. sanctions on Venezuela fit the definition of collective punishment of the civilian population as described in both the Geneva and Hague International Conventions, to which the U.S. is a signatory. They are illegal under international law and under U.S. domestic law. So these are crimes against humanity that the U.S. is carrying out. So what all of this shows is that sanctions are not an alternative to war, as they're frequently presented. Sanctions are a form of war. Economic warfare is just as deadly as military conventional war. If a bomb drops on your house or you starve to death, you still die. It doesn't really matter. In fact, one form of death is much longer and drawn out. Starvation. People who can't get medicine and can't get medical equipment they need, so they die from cancer. They die from diabetes. I've seen firsthand the impact of illegal U.S. sanctions in Venezuela and Nicaragua. It is devastating for the civilian population. So it is important to highlight the fact that these U.S. sanctions have backfired and weakened the hegemony of the dollar and fueled countries around the world to seek alternatives. But it's also important to stress in the first place that sanctions are illegal a form of war and collective punishment of the entire civilian population. And literally millions of civilians have lost their lives because of Western sanctions.
Now, if people are interested in learning more about the move toward de-dollarization in countries around the world, especially in the global south, dropping the dollar and creating alternative payment systems and financial systems and economic architecture, I will link in the description below to two other reports that I did. One looking at how the BRIC system of Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa they have a bank called the New Development Bank, which is an alternative to the U.S.-dominated World Bank and International Monetary Fund. And they are de-dollarizing gradually and moving away from the dollar and giving loans in local currencies. I also did another report recently looking at how countries like China, Brazil, Russia, Kenya, Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, and Indonesia and Malaysia and other countries that make up the ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, they are all additionally creating new payment systems and economic institutions to trade in their local currencies and challenge the hegemony of the US dollar. We are living in a watershed moment in history right now. Things are changing very rapidly and the tectonic plates of geopolitics and economics are shifting everywhere you look. So in the description below, I will link to those other reports and you can get more information. I'm Ben Norton, Editor-in-Chief of Geopolitical Economy Report. These are the issues that we report on regularly here. If you want to support the work that we do, we're completely independent and have no big sponsors. We rely entirely on viewers and listeners. So please consider going to geopoliticaleconomy.com slash support or you can become a patron over at patreon.com slash geopolitical economy. If you're watching on YouTube, please subscribe. If you're listening on a podcast app, please subscribe as well to help boost our reporting in the algorithm. I wanna thank everyone and I'll see you all next time.